Uh, but I mean, when when you start at anything from from like nowhere, like you, you don't know anything. So I mean, learning your instrument was the most important. But um, the idea of going on to the, the idea of even playing a gig was so foreign at that age that it was more about just like learning how to play our instruments. And then eventually you build ever so slowly, um, you know, year on year, you've got like little little wins going and playing your first few shows and then play, playing like a, a headline slot in your own town, which is big for us because like, you know, like there's not too many bands in Oma. It's like 20,000 people. It's a very, very small place. So you, you learn like, you learn absolutely everything from starting from the very, very beginning and making sure you do it all yourselves. But like, yeah, that's pretty much it, yeah. And how, how, because I know that in that band you kind of supported Richard Hawley, Dirty Pretty Things, uh, bands like that. How did you get your opportunities? Just because I, I kind of figured there's probably a few artists here. Who's, who's here is, it's in, a, in a band? And who here is like, not in a band, but part of the sort of industry, like the management and, and all the rest of it. Okay, so like, I mean, that's pretty good. These are all like, everybody had their hand up on something there. So these are in the right place. Like, <laughs> anybody's here for the pots and pans convention, that's next door. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, how do, we, how do we get to that point? I mean, you just, you play like tons of gigs and uh, we, we like, managed to like play gigs in different times. We had like friends and bands in different times. So. We, we knew how to get like a hundred people into a venue where we were and then you had to get a hundred people into a venue where they were so we just switched we were like right we'll go up to you play in front of your fans you come down to us play in front of our fans and we just recorded like a load of really really rubbish music to start off with like uh, I mean there's like two EPs and stuff that never really made the light of day because they weren't very good and we were only starting out some some bands have this thing where like the first ever song they write tends to be probably the best song that they'll ever write. And then it's the music after that is actually the quite difficult thing. Thankfully, we didn't really have that problem. We released, like, or didn't release, but we recorded, like, God, hours of absolute shite. <laughs> and um, when we, like, got it all out of our system and sort of learned, or sort of started studying songwriting a little bit more as well. Like, and, like, they, they say the best songwriters are those that try to imitate their heroes, but fall short. Like they say that the best ones are the ones that can't Im imitate the people that they love. So they, uh, it ends up becoming truly original. Um, we ended up like releasing one song. We brought it into a magazine and it was on a blank CDR. This, this is like, this is like not what not to do. This is basically <laughs> like, there's a lot of what not to do in the book, but um, we brought went in with this blank CDR and just like flung it onto the desk and that was it. And I think they were so, the, the magazine was so perplexed that a band could be that stupid to come in without anything written on it, that they actually did some investigative journalism, found out who we were and wrote about it, which ended up getting a plane on the radio so when we got loads of gigs. It yeah, worked. It, yeah, but a lot of, <laughs> lot of the people do that sort of like mystic thing where they will not show their face and it's all very, um, you know, considered. Yeah. This was just, we were just idiots, <laughs> really. Now we're here obviously to talk about the book, Sacred like Guide to the Music Industry. I feel like you're in a really special position to talk about this. You know, you've been the artist, you're the, the breaker of new music uh, on radio. Um, you have your own record label, Hometown Records, and of course you're a fan of music. Um, I, I hope. Uh, <laughs> you're a wrong gig or not. <laughs> could, you, uh, could you maybe talk about how you came up with the idea for the book? Yeah, so like, uh, I, like when you, anybody, like obviously the people who stuck their hands up um, who are in bands like will know that like there's certain aspects to getting your band to that next step, whether it's just getting it to a gig or whether it's getting it to, to radio or whether it's getting it on playlists or, or whether it's get, making a music video or whether it's like looking into management or publishing or any, the rest of it. There's so many reasons for you just to sit down and bash your head against the wall going why is this not working this is really difficult i don't understand this and maybe what you do is what maybe the same thing i did when i was like 18 19 is i would rely on like other bands for 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 knowledge so if something would happen say we wanted to play a festival and i'd been sending emails off to every flipping festival in the world and nobody was getting back I'd go to my friend and ask them for a little bit of advice 
and they would give me some advice and then maybe that wouldn't work either and you'd just be like, well, how, like, like, things are, are, are going fairly well at the minute, you know, we're getting played on, on the radio and this, that and the other. And I just thought there's a massive um, knowledge gap where you can find out what you need online if you go to this website for publishing, if you go to this website for touring, if you go to this website for that, this, that and the other. I thought, well, there needs to be a book or there needs to be something like that, which is that, um, that brings it all into one place. It's tangible and means something and actually has legit advice um, that you can you can use straight away. And, and the advice that's in the book isn't actually me going, this is what you should do or whatever. Like you could fill a, you could fill this whole venue out with what I don't know about the music industry, but I also do know a lot of like great people who who do know the answers to those questions. So that's why, like in the book, I split it up between um, artists on one side and industry on the other. So like I interviewed like Run the Jewels and Biffy Clyro and Loyal Carner and Blossoms and Slaves and Neo and Lil Sims and like loads of other artists about how they got their booking agent, about like the, the first time they turned up and played a live show, what, what the toys and tribulations were of that, what publishing is. And then on the second side of every chapter, you've got industry people. So say it's like a festival, you'll have the head of a festival going, this is how you do it. You'll have a PR person going, this is the best way you do your PR. And there's a lot of conflict in the book as well because there's no one path for everybody to go on in the music industry. If you make hip hop music, your journey is going to be different to somebody that makes reggae, to, to somebody that makes post rock, to somebody that makes Gregorian chants. Do you know what I mean? Like every single avenue is very, very different. So it was very, very uh, important for me to have both sides represented the artists who did it and the people that helped get them there. Definitely, and I think it's, it's quite easy to look at that long list of incredible artists and think, well, you know, it's, it's hard to picture, I guess, some of those artists in the very early days, just like you were, just like any of the artists here, like just trying to make their way and to figure it out. Well, sort of like thing. George Ezra is, is in the book as well. And you're like, George Ezra is what, like the biggest selling male artist? Actually, maybe it's probably not Ed Sheeran, it's probably bigger than him, right? But that's, I mean, he still, he still sold a couple of records, right? But like George Ezra's in the book, and you may be going, oh, what does George Ezra know about DIY? But every artist has to start somewhere, and he, he had to slog it out his way up the ladder before he landed at a major record label and and all the rest of it. The Half the songs that he made in his first album were written before he had any sort of representation around him. So he talks in the, in, in the book about um, working in a pub and writing his music, and some dude who walked into the pub who had a record studio, seen him, and he, they worked together on writing the record, or not write the record, but writing the early songs that ended up getting him to the attention of um, like Columbia Records, which now, you know, like he's absolutely like smashing it, whether you like his music or not. I mean, that, that shotgun track will haunt me the rest of my days, <laughs> but um, you, you can't, you have to admire somebody who just had the sort of brashness to make it happen for himself, because that's, really one of the most important things about the music industry is is to know and to be and, and to console yourself with the fact that nobody is going to care as much about your project as you do and and to know that like i i know that as well so anybody i work with like on on, on anything nobody will they, they you have to love it and you have to make it happen so you have to be the one that works at it the most you can't sit back and wait and rely on a manager or a record label, and even if you do get a manager or a record label, the likelihood of them having other people is like you, you have to drive everything forward and be the, the nucleus and the spark at the same time. Definitely, and I mean, we were talking beforehand about this and how, you know, it's a good couple years of, you know, writing research in interviewing, is that right? Um, do you have any standout memories from that process and interviewing artists or anything in particular that sticks out from the, the writing process? There's, there's two that come to mind. The very first interview I did for the book was um, with Simon Neal from Biffy Clyro. And I always like, really admired Biffy because Biffy like, did it all themselves from the very beginning. They, 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 they sort of 
did the unsigned thing and then they did the like indie label thing. They got to the top of the indie label thing and then they decided, right, we want to go and become a, a, a world famous band. So they went to the majors. And he gave me two hours of his time and I sat and interviewed him about like, God, like, very, he's in, it, he's in it quite a lot about like, yeah, about radio, about online print PR, all the rest of it. And he drank about five Moscow Mule cocktails in the in the two hours. That, like I tried to match him as well. I went in completely sober doing that interview and came out absolutely hammered in about after about two hours. Um, on top of that, like uh, I'm a big fan of like hip hop music and rap music, and uh, Run the Jewels are one of the biggest DIY hip hop groups in in the world at the minute, and they've done it all on their own terms. And it was great to, to chat to Killer Mike, who um, was saying like, he'd been in the major labels before, and he'd be sitting around the table, and some guy um, with a turtleneck would stand up in it, in the middle of it, and he would be like, well, Dave doesn't like your FIFA song. And he'd be like, well, who the fuck is Dave? <laughs> do you know what I mean? So he's like, no, we gotta do this ourselves. Um, so I interviewed Run The Jewels 20 minutes before they went on and did their biggest ever UK show at Brixton Academy and they were re really happy to give me that time as well so cool. and I was very well aware that they were like like literally lunging <laughs> and I was like going so what, what is it like being an independent artist and they're like going yeah man it's really hard it's all. <laughs> like, wait, wait, I need to I need to leave I need to let you guys do your shit did LP have his sunglasses he had on? his sunglasses on obviously it. always um, so I'm, I'd quite like to take uh, to touch on sort of the tastemakers of the music industry, the modern music industry, and obviously BBC Radio 1, BBC Introducing. Um, BBC Introducing, it's been around for about 10 years now. How, how important do you think the BBC and BBC Introducing in particular, how important do you think that is as a, as a tastemaker and a career builder as musicians? Boom. I don't know if I, <laughs> I'm still taking my time to think about it. Um, I, I don't know if I think, I think the BBC Music Introducing is is less tastemaker and more necessary service. Mm. Like what the, the, the BBC at the end of the day is a public service broadcaster and it, it should represent every single side of the UK, whether like for like wherever it is you're from, whatever sort of music it is you make, it should have a place somewhere on the BBC network and supporting grassroots music is, is one of the most important things and it's something that like I've been all around the world talking about radio and I've, I've sat in Colombia and I've sat in New York and I've sat in, in Dublin and Norway and Belgium and there you might think that we have it hard over here we literally have the best system for grassroots music and, uh, in radio specifically than anywhere else because they don't have the, the that BBC Music Introducer. If you don't know what that is, it's like any track, wherever it is you are, say you're a, a, like on the, one of the islands, say you're in the Shetland Islands in Scotland and you're making music, you can upload it and it'll be sent to BBC Local in Scotland and they'll have an introducing show which is de uh, designed to play brand new music from from that area of Scotland, or from the area of Norfolk, or the area of Northern Ireland, or the area of Cornwall. There's 47 stations throughout the UK, and doesn't matter where your postcode is, it fits in with one of them. So you have your music, you upload it to the BBC Introduce and Uploader, and it will be sent to whatever postcode is applicable. So it would, like it, here it would be BBC Norfolk, and at Saturdays, I think it's Saturdays at like eight o'clock or something, That's isn't it? it? Yeah. Um, they'll they'll play an hour. They'll play it two hours sometimes. Like it depends how long the shows are. Um, off music from that region. And I think that's amazing. And you think, well, okay, it's getting played on BBC Local, but like that's where Two Door Cinema Club started. That's where Jake Bug started. That's where Florence and the Machine started. Um, like list list goes on. And a lot of those artists got championed by the person who uh, works on that station, they went to Radio 1 and they were like going, right, you've got a lot more listeners than us, will you play this artist from our area? Because everybody's really proud of um, you know, where you come from. You're always a little bit more biased to artists, to where you, where you come from, just because of your 
sort of like little like your patriotism to the area um, and then like really one play and then you get played in fa like you can go on and play festivals you can go play different gigs throughout the world and then it's not written into the BBC introducing code but I'd imagine you probably sign to a major record label buy a yacht um, I'm pretty sure develop some, bad, de develop some bad habits go to rehab and then get out of it buy another yacht sign another record deal become a multi-billionaire lose it then get it back again then die I think it's in the terms when you upload I think, the... <laughs> I think I'm not certain <laughs> But yeah, I, I imagine, you know, if, if you haven't checked it out and you've got music, definitely check out BBC Introducing, Uploader. Like, I, I grew up in Norwich, I live in London now, but I know Norwich has always been lucky to have such a wealth of great music. And I know BBC uh, Introducing in Norfolk has been brilliant to connect people. And, you know, I think Ducking Punches around here, I think they played Reading maybe through BBC Introducing. It's, it's a way, way to get through it. but. In the age of streaming and, and digital music, what are your thoughts on Spotify and, and their sig increasing significance as um, sort of as a tastemaker with playlists and stuff like that? What are your, what are your feelings on, on that? I mean, like, the, like what we do on the radio and what, what, what Spotify do are like essentially two very different things, but approaching the same, same thing. Like, I mean, a lot of people find their music through radio. A lot of people find their music through playlists. I personally don't. I'm not. I'm not in like one camp or the other. Uh, I think it's. I think it's kind of foolish for you to go. Well, only people find their music on radio, or only people find their way their music on on Spotify. Like people aren't as simple um, to be placed into little groups like that. Like I find as much music from chatting to a friend. Uh, well, I think is a lot of my friends work in music as well, so I mean that, that does that does seem to help a little bit. But I find find music in so many different places that I, f I find find it difficult to put myself into a statistic and going. I only listen to my new music on a playlist, or I only listen to my new music on a radio. Um, Spotify definitely has like I mean I've had Spotify now for like ten years. I, I OG subscriber. I remember like putting, putting one of my band's music on it like about ten years ago, and you think because it's been on there for ten years, we'd have a, loads of millions of streams now. <laughs> it's still it's still got that really dreaded, um, <laughs> let, not not as great as a thousand. Yeah. You know when you haven't got up to a thousand yet. Yeah, I've still got that on one of my tracks up there, which is great. Good thing about the radio is they they don't have numbers like that, so that you they, you can't be number shamed yeah. um, on the radio. Um, I think radio has a massive place um, because it's got human curation and it's got some, somebody who's passionate about the music contextually explaining it and I think there's an added 10%. I think if you listen to something on the radio and there's somebody passionately talking about it, it'll almost make you like it a little about 10% more mm. and, and get you into it and get you sort of in, in, in that m mode. Yeah. Um, I find playlists, I, I hate the idea of an algorithm, I hate the idea of a computer or an algorithm or like a code thinking that it knows what I like. So when I, when I go on like a, my daily mix, I'm like, you, like no, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Like I, I like listening to post rock, I like listening to grime, I like listening to hip hop, drum and bass. The idea that people are just stuck in one style of music or one mood is bullshit. Rebel against the the machines, yeah. like <laughs> yeah, rage against the machine, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? That's, that's a good, good name. Bad name. That's yeah. actually yeah, yeah really good. Uh, <laughs> so obviously the you know the book is a lot of it is how to get your foot in the door as a young artist, and I would highly recommend it. We've got a couple 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 copies. Um, a couple, couple of copies. A couple of copies. Yeah, I've, uh, I, I've come from Brighton. I've got ten in my bag. So if anybody wants to buy one, grab me on the way out because that means I can get back to Brighton with a lighter bag. The music industry is often, you know, a context game. I, I, I can imagine so many eyes might feel, you know, overwhelmed by the amount of artists and how do you get to that one person to, you know, progress. Um, and it's also probably quite daunting. For emerging artists to approach people within the industry, um, like what what advice could you give to them about you know the contacts game, approaching people? 
like stuff. Yeah, I mean, like you have to think about it. Like it's like an open door, and you've got about fifteen thousand people at the, all at the same time trying to walk through that door, and there's only room for like. Like one person to squeeze and pop through to the other side, mm. because like I mean, I I'm I'm very lucky. I get to pick all the records that I play on on the radio, and I don't get I don't get hammered by my bosses or management or my producers to play certain things. I've I've got a fairly decent autonomy to to play the tracks that I like, but I also get sent a shitload of music, and like I mean, I get sent tens tens of stuff on DMs. Then hundreds of stuff on one email account, and then about a hundred or two hundred on the other. So like, it's probably in the in the re region of like four to five hundred tracks a day. And my job isn't like I, I do like lot like lots of different stuff. My job isn't to sit go at work, clock in at nine o'clock in the morning, stick the headphones on, <laughs> and sit there till five o'clock, and go okay, these are the songs I like, and these are the ones I don't. <laughs> I mean, as as fun as that would be. Uh, you, you have to go out and actually do other stuff too. Um, it, it's it's the music it's the, it's the music and it's the excitement that, that gets gets me. I mean, this is sound very vague, but it's it's completely true. Like if it's the excitement around it, it's like if you can see people tweeting, retweeting, and all the rest of it, like about the music, and it feels exciting, and, and the tracks are absolutely killer. Like it begins and ends with amazing music. But I guess the question is, how do you get the, be the the amazing music in front of you? And the best way I like I've always thought is you can chase people down, and 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 that does work. People do chase me down. I do play um, the music on the radio, whether they've got radio pluggers, labels, or whatever. I'll play stuff if it's unsigned, as long as it's a good tune. That that's that's basically it. But it's like, how do you reach out to just more than one person? And that's by making a shit ton of noise in in your hometown, mm. and you're like, right, well, how do I do that? So the, it all stems back to this. There's so many people in Norwich that will come down to London that know people in the music industry, and once one band is starting to make a noise and they're selling out like a 50 capacity show or a 100 capacity show, once that noise starts happening, it's very easy for people to go like start talking about it. Like bands like. Um, like the Sherlock's and Sheffield, for a recent recent example, like they uh, they're not my favourite band in the world by any stretch of the imagination, but I mean they they were selling loads of tickets. There was people running around with their T-shirts on, like you know you, you could see it moving um, on Instagram and and social media, just because people connected with your music. If you're creating your own scene and people are connecting with your music, wearing your merch, um, you know like going out and being a, a billboard for you and talking about your music, then that, that then everybody wants in on that. That's that's what the most important thing is happening in Dublin at the minute. There's like there's tons of bands that are really selling tickets and it's getting really exciting and there's a scene. So the whole of the UK at the minute for the first time in my lifetime anyway is looking at an area and that area is Dublin at, at the moment. I think it must be, you know, it's it's kind of overwhelming the thought of trying to build that community. But you know it yeah. starts. It starts small. All, all you yeah, have to do exactly. instead, of, instead of playing ten gigs, in like in your area, play like play one gig mm. and book out the, the above a pub yourself, and don't play ten support slots. Do one headline show and and, and plug it for months, and get everybody through that door. Because then when you've got 50 people through the door, that's when you come to a local promoter, like you were back in the day, yeah, yeah. and you go, we just sold 50 tickets down, down X, Y, and Z. So then you're sitting there going, actually, I really need a support band for Bombay Bicycle Club. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that you've seen they've sold 50 tickets, you're like right in the door. Definitely. That's definitely the way. I don't want to book your gigs for you. Like, yeah. but <laughs> I'm just making notes. Yeah. Um, and I mean, a lot of the book as well is about you know finding the right representation once you kind of got to a point where you've you know you you can bring those fifty people, hundred people, um, and it touches upon you know management, recording, getting gigs, everything, um, everything is covered. So in terms of management, I mean we're in an age where there are more tool, more tools available than ever for emerging artists, but it's probably more confusing and competitive as ever as well. When when do you think an artist like the artist here 
When do you think the right time might be for them to think about getting a manager, for instance? It's kind of like how long is a piece of string, really. Like with that, some some managers work with artists from the very very beginning, and there's like for like real fortuitous moments. Like I, I like on my label, the um, the guy who I run it with also manages like two artists. One of them he found at a house party and he was playing guitar in the corner, and the other one he was at an open mic night and like um, signed. Uh, her name's Wilds. Um, up when she was sixteen. And both both were like totally by accident. And he managed them from the start. I think like it's very. It takes so long to break artists now, and it takes so long to break bands. Um, that's why you see you don't see major record labels um, signing bands up much anymore because it takes. What 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 it used to be like back back in back in the day like when, <laughs> b before before I was running labels or anything back when God was a boy. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, it was pretty easy because there was less media about. It was like, right, get your band in the NME, get Zane Lowe to play it on the radio, get on MTV too, boom, then you've, you're selling 5,000 tickets now. Like, there's a, you're battling with the whole world, and you're not even battling with the whole world, but you're like battling with the whole history of recorded music. <laughs> when you stick your music up on Spotify, you're not fighting against who the new bands, you're fighting against Prince, Bruce Springsteen, the Beatles, everybody can listen to everything at any point now, so it's very, it, it's more difficult, like, it's never been easier to get your music out, but it's never been more difficult to stand out from the crowd, I think. Um, so that's why it takes ages to build, build an audience, like I'm working with a punk band at the minute, and um, I started working with them when they were 15, and they're 19 now, and we're only going to put an album out next year, so you can, like, that's what, like four years from starting to work together to putting a record out. Um, so, like, it is difficult in, in that um, in that respect, but in terms of getting like a manager, um, I think you need to have made a lot of your own mistakes first. Like, you need to be absolutely shredding live. You need to be, and if you're not live, if you're a bedroom producer, your beats need to be on point. But you need to have gone out and almost experienced what it's like to manage yourself first. Because then you'll you'll have empathy for them when, when you guys like work together. But go out and make a lot of mistakes and get as ready as you possibly can. Almost don't prepare for you to have a manager or don't prepare to have, that there will be a label involved. Go into it thinking that you're just going to do it and then that's that's going to be it. And then when the manager comes, it'll be like a happy accident, you know. I kind of feel like it's that uncomfortable truth as well, where you know artists, you need to be completely set up. DIY, know as much as you can about the music industry as a whole, get the book. Um, and you kind of, you build it up, you get so good at being DIY and independent that, you know, you, you've started having a fan base, you started getting interest, and, and then that's when the people that you could have used to help might come and knock in, basically. And it's, it's that frustration of that, but I mean, it's better to make mistakes than make mistakes and pay 20% to a manager. Yeah. So, um, and in terms of, you know, I, I bang on about social media quite a lot. On like image and identity, especially with social media and video content, how important do you think it is for an artist to have the whole package, like the logo, the look, the branding, on that side of things? Yeah, well, I mean, take bands out of it for a second, like take like, just anybody with social media, like anybody who's got a remote pastime now markets themselves as like some sort of consultant. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? It's like, like, you know, somebody who's been to the gym once is now taking photos of themselves, like going to the gym, like, uh, like flat out, or somebody who's <laughs> like figured out how to like, I don't know, like um, put on fake nails now has like an Instagram account like sorted out. Everybody knows how to market themselves really well. And it's really scary because like in a couple of years time, all 14 year olds now will all be marketing executives like by the time they're 19. Multi-millionaires. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but like, so, I mean, there's no excuse for being shit at social media, especially if you're young. Because if you're like, you know, if you're under like the age of like 25, then you don't really remember much of a life without social media. So there's no excuse about being bad at it. Like I, I've got, like I look, as, as I said, like I look after a 19-year-old punk band, and I thought this is going to be great. They're going to be so good at social media. 
Like they, I, I, they use all their own personal ones. They're really funny on it. It's great. Um, and you know, it's got a lot of personality. The band social media lays dormant. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will touch it. And I keep saying to them, like, you know, if you you have to keep up with this, it's a necessary evil. I would I hate the idea of having to say to a band going, you have to post stuff on social media. Like it goes completely against <laughs> everything that I stand for in music, but also if you don't play the game, you're gonna fall behind. So if you think, oh, social media is not that important, then you, you'll only ever be as big as getting whoever you meet word of mouth into your gig. Uh, if you're really proud of what you do, and you, you don't even have to look cool, but you've just got like a, you've got an idea of what you do, whether you're funny or serious or Whatever it is, whatever personality you have, just amp that up and, and use that as your own social media. Definitely, no one wants to see, we've got a gig in a week, we've got a gig in two days, gigs tomorrow, gigs tonight, nothing. Yeah. Like, like, like who, who are the best to engage with on social media? People like slaves and, and idols Capaldi. and shames, Lewis Capaldi is like the, I mean he, would not, he wouldn't have a career without it, would he? Like? No, <laughs> he's figured it out, like Snapchat. Yeah, I mean, he got have good songs, but like, Personality. I think it's just getting that personality across. It doesn't matter, you know, what you're into. Whatever your love is, like you might be, you know, a thimble collector. But if you're a thimble collector that can communicate why that's important and do it in a fun way or whatever, then maybe that's your bag. Like I love how earnest everybody's got in social media now. Like, like the, 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 everybody, teenagers are turning into aunties, and it's really fucking embarrassing. <laughs> Like, um, like, like, there's like young ones that are working at, at Radio One where, where I work, like literally like 19, 20, and they're putting up motivational posts and then like, you know, like a load of emojis afterwards. And I'm like, my auntie does the exact same thing as that, but on Facebook. And I was like, what is going on? He's like over emotional, like, <laughs> it's, like, it's, like those people, it's so embarrassing. It's like those people that feel like they have to condemn whatever is needing to be condemned as if you know, they are the government. Here's the bandwagon, I'm jumping on it. Yeah. So we touched upon, you know, uh, everyone having access to recording software and everything, and the fact that you listen to a hell of a lot of music. Do you think there's a right way about going about recording music in terms of, you know, do you save up, save your money, go to the studio, get it mixed, get it mastered, have that one single to release, or do you think, you know, get garage band, figure it out, get the structure of the song. One of the, one of the things like I, I really sort of almost regret about the music career I had when I was when I was younger is we got way too precious about far too little music. Mm -hmm. Once you think that you've written the tune or you think you've written the EP, we I think we like kept going on about this EP for like a year and a yeah. half or whatever. Well, and, and you almost stop writing music because you're like going, well, this is the perfect EP. I'll never have to write any music again. Not even thinking about the fact going, if this EP actually does quite well, shit, we might actually need to write an album. Um, that, that I think you should always be writing. I don't think I don't think writing for the sake of a project is good enough. Um, I don't think that successful musicians genuinely just go, I'm just going to write this EP and then that's it until I have to write another EP. I think the, the successful musicians and the successful writers are the ones that are always doing it and they're, and they're continually doing it. Because just writing one song and if that song, what if that song doesn't do well? Or what if it doesn't live up to your expectations? Then you're going into the process of writing the next song on a massive downer. Whereas like you should be writing music for the reason of enjoying and studying the art of writing music. Now, like, like writing songs is not just divine intervention. I mean, it is for some people where like a, a chorus and a pre-chorus and a or middle eight or whatever will just drop from the sky. A lot of the best songwriters will look at other songwriters, will study it, they'll study their craft. They'll be like, right, well, why did they do that? And what, or, or that bit in a, a Dylan tune or that bit in a Justice track um, would look, work really well in in this bit of mine. So I think like, I always think you should write way more music than, I don't think people write enough music and I think they expect the four songs that they've done to be able to carry them through their career, whereas you should just keep on writing all the time. And I think in, in the book, I know Little Sims talks about 
collaboration with other writers and other artists and everything. And I, I wonder if artists maybe are a little bit too precious about sharing the creative process because they feel like maybe they're losing stuff even though they're working with other people. What would you, you know, do you recommend collaborations for some of the artists? All the time, yeah, like totally. I think like, um, you'd be really surprised at like how many bands, like how many sort of like, you know, legit bands there are who have co-writers or who have people behind the scenes helping them write music. D d does it, like, at the end of the day, if a, if a song connects with somebody, do I care where, where it came from? Not, not really. I mean, if it was written by an army of writers and they're passing themselves off as, like, um, slaves or, like, a black flag or something, I'd probably be like, well, all right, well, this is, <laughs> this is a little bit shit. But um, you'll be good at something that somebody else isn't and vice versa. So if there's somebody out there who's like absolutely sick at drums or horns or whatever, and you can't play either, then why don't you get them on your track? The majority of people like playing for the sake of playing anyway, so the, most people would be happy to say yeah. Some people wouldn't. Some people would tell you to go and take a run and jump. But there's, the, there's nothing to be lost from collaborating with people. Like a lot of the be best artists and biggest like pop stars will we'll go in with a producer and do a day and the majority of the time, like 9 out of 10 times, they'll go in and do a day with X big producer or X big producer and 9 times out of 10 it doesn't work and you never get to hear the song. But they, most pop writers will go in and throw as much shit at the wall with so many people to see what actually sticks. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's got to be done because there's only so much you can, you can get stuck into that pattern of like, oh, that's kind of how I always write, and you might need that other artist just to kind of... It is, well, write, something. writing is a very private thing, so I understand why it's very difficult for people to, to collaborate with people as well. Like, you know, the, the act of being confessional in front of a guitar and sitting down and, and pouring your heart or fears or joys or tribulations onto, onto like a, a, a recording, it can be quite emotional to try and switch that with somebody so I do understand why it doesn't happen as well like it's not something that you have to do but I mean you gotta challenge yourself at everything right definitely um we're getting fairly close to the end I've still got a few questions but um if you can maybe get get thinking of any questions that you might want to pose in about five ten minutes or so um it was interesting what you were saying about gigs before you know one band having a solid fan base, another having it and switching, gig swapping, all that. There are so many bands and artists and many ven venues are kind of closing, as we well know, across the UK. What advice could you give to artists that are looking for shows but struggling to get the opportunities, especially out of town? Because, you know, there are, we're lucky in Norwich that there are so many venues that you can probably get your hands on, but then to make their jump to play London, Manchester, Nottingham, Leicester, wherever it might be, do you have any advice for that? Yeah, I mean, like, I think people are getting like really savvy with like where, where they play and how they play. There's nothing to stop you playing at a house party. Well, apart from maybe somebody's mum or dad. Like, <laughs> but um, I, what, what I've seen a lot of bands in Brighton do, that's where I live at the minute, um, is they, they re hire a rehearsal room, uh, like one of the bigger rehearsal rooms, and both their first shows are like in the rehearsal room to like 10 people to 15 people. It, it's really good practice just playing in front of other people that aren't the people that are in your bands. Like, I, I would definitely say don't wait for your opportunity. Don't wait for the support slot to come on, come to you. Like, I think you have to put your own shows on and you have to put your neck out there. And putting on a show, like, as scary as it might be, maybe like hiring a sign band for 100 quid or hiring the room, like, you, you probably will have to spend about 100, 200, Quid, 300 quid maybe um, putting on a show but if you really 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 go at it and get as many people you'll make you'll make it back if you can get like 50 people in, in the room 40 people in the room 30 people in the room and you'll have done it yourself so the comp the, the amount of um, confidence that you'll get from that will only spur you on to do great things after definitely and I think at the end of the day you have to invest not only time but you're gonna have to invest money into what you're doing so that sounds like a Probably good way, and also it's just building the community and 
you know, engaging with other people and you never know who might, oh, such and such is putting on a gig, I'm going to jump on that. Or... Well, it's, it's difficult to get money together, like, to, for, for me, like, music is a really expensive thing to get into, like, buying guitars, buying equipment, buying, like, getting gigs, traveling, it, it is really, it is really expensive to do, but at the same time, you're investing in yourself and you're investing in something you love and that's the way you have to look at it. Um, and like that's not only just the time, but it's it's the money as well. And only the people that, that have that will invest both of those into themselves are the ones that are going to really crack on and make a career out of it. Yeah, definitely. I could literally talk about this all day long. Yeah, boot it out. Yeah, we've still got a little while. Like, like, like a club <laughs> on here in about like eight hours. Think they, 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 that'd be fun, wouldn't it? I think uh, it's my lore and uh, Bond playing later. Like, uh, I think something like that. I'm gonna. Before I go to, was that five minutes? Five minutes left. Okay, we're gonna go to audience questions now, I think. Does anyone have any questions? There's one over here. Yeah, I think, do we have a mic? Yeah. yeah. Just over front row, that side. Thank you. Um, what's your favorite band that has come through uh, the BBC introducing, like personal favorite? Of all the ones that like, obviously made it through that system. Do you know Soak? Have you heard of Soak? Um, if you are, you heard of Slaves, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean Slaves. Well, like Soak and Slaves have been my two favourites. Like, I remember like Slaves were play. They got into BBC introducing Kent, um, and they uploaded their music through there, and it, it moved really fast for them. But they were just really good live, and because they got their stuff on BBC introducing the Kent. The Kent team asked them to go and play the Reading and Leeds Festival. So I got to introduce them on stage at their first ever festival appearance. And I'd never met them before. And um, Isaac's the one that is the, is the singer. He normally has his like, shirt off. But he was, he was wearing a full suit and tie. And I walked up to him before they went on. I'd never met him before. And I was like, have you just come from work? <laughs> and he was like, no, this is what we, we dress like. And they went out and absolutely killed it. So yes, yeah, slaves probably. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Sever. Thanks. Hi. Who's, who's on the spotlight? Um, Killer work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a musician, a singer songwriter, and I'm gigging all the time around my areas. But I kind of find I'm doing it in the same venues all the time, and I want to branch out of my like branch out of the area but I find it's quite difficult to gig like in places like London because it's quite saturated with the music scene. I was wondering if you've got any advice of like branching out of your local area, if that makes you sense. You just have to take the leap, you have to take the jump. Like uh, I mean like it is it is saturated and it's not it's never gonna be less saturated. But if you believe in what what, what you do then if you think you're better than the, everybody else that's playing in a, a, like in that area, like in London, like you go out, there, you'll obviously shine through, but you, ha you like you'll never know how how you're gonna do it until you do it. Like you you gotta go in and sort of make your own mark on it. Just bug the hell out of like uh, as many promoters as you ha as you can, and like it doesn't necessarily have to be London as well. Like you you can go to other other um, cities and play and get noticed. As well, like you know, it's not like Norwich is like t like a tiny backwater town. Like it's a it's a city. very city. F very yeah, but that's what I mean. Like it, 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 but it's not like it's a backwater town. No, like it's it, it's a very vibrant um, and and cool city. So like you know, you can still get noticed here. Like there is there is industry here, but if you want to break out of here and play different places, then you just gotta sort of take the leap of faith, really. Thank you. Who else we got? Anyone else over here? So my band have just released a new track literally today called Pin Ups. It's called Lazy. You should go listen to it. It's really good. Um, it's about eight minutes long, and we've just literally uploaded it to um, to radio. It's introduced in amazing radio, etc. Um, and we're just trying to get gauge an idea of going to national radio, looking at Radio One, the big boys. Um, what is the maximum length, would you say, realistically, to get a track played on a tastemaker? show or something like that. There are certain points that we can cut at, but we don't want to lose the integrity Is it post-rock? 
yeah, I would describe it. It's it's post rock psychedelic into indie as well in there. It's so difficult. Like a, it's, a, it's such a good question because like, like post rock's always a journey, isn't it? Like, sure. like for for the heavy bits to hit heavy, you need the light bits yeah. to to lead up to it. Um, I mean, like I've played anything up to I think about maybe eleven minutes might 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 be my 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 uh, record for playing a, a one song. Who said that? Record yeah. back. No, that's what I do when I'm DJing out. That's when you hear New Order Blue Monday coming on. <laughs> or if I really gotta go, if I gotta go like number two, it's gonna be Bohemian Rhapsody. But um, uh, the thing about like if you like, to start to start with BBC introducing on that question. Normally the shows are an hour long, so like. It has to be good enough for the person who runs that show to go, I'm going to give you a sixth of my show, which, which is very difficult. The real, the real rule of thumb is the shorter the track, the more likely it is to get played. Because if you're trying to play, like, if you're like frustrated like, like I am, because I have two hours of radio a week to play music, whereas I probably would like about 10, it's very difficult for me to look at an eight minute track and go, I've got 30 tracks here I want to play, but I have to give up the, the time for three for, for, for yours. Um, like, I mean, as a genre, it's not really one of the most radio friendly, but that's not to say that there's not room for it. Like, I mean, Six Music play, play a lot of that style of music as well. Um, I, th I would, do, I mean, the, like the label side of me would say, don't bother ever doing a radio edit, keep your art, your art. But the radio side of me, he's just, would would just go. You're more likely to get played if it's shorter, and that's just that's just how it is, really. Yeah. Like Jake Bug had one of his first singles was like a minute and thirty, and it probably got played about fifty more times on radio one daytime simply because people fucked up their timings going into the news. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, so like yeah, and like Two Your Cinema Club had like a minute and a half song as well. So there'd be many times when I was doing daytime and be like, well, oh my god. Do I talk for two and a half minutes, or do we play this two door song? Let's play the two door song. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, like it is going to be, a, it is going to be difficult to get a play. But I mean, that's why the Radio One Rock Show, Dan P. Carter's there. That's why Six Music's there. That's why various different taste makers are there. You just you have to hope and pray that they'll take a leap of faith on that. Yeah, and if it, I was to upload the the full version, the eight minute version, is there any chance that if it was good enough, they would pick a point to? Fade out, or do I have to do that for you? No, they like they they they'll never do a, no. they'll never do a battlefield yeah. radio edit of your show because yeah. they're just they're <laughs> so busy. Do you know what I mean? You got to make everything as easy for yeah, everybody. For sure. I mean, one piece of advice I got outside of that is if you're sending music to anybody, don't send a wee transfer. Don't send something that they have to download. So you, you've all got like computers and iPads yourself, like, and you've got no room left on it. And then somebody sends you a WAV, which is like 400 gigabytes and wallet for like a three minute song. And you're like, uh, <laughs> any chance of a stream? <laughs> yeah, it's just keep, keep it easy. Just, people want an easy life. <laughs> yeah. On that note, actually, so sending an EPK, what's the best format you would send an EPK in? I've been doing it as a Google Drive folder at the moment. So it's got everything there, one link that then takes you to a PDF document with information, the track, but then if I add an attachment to an email, can that automatically get, you know, junked because I've read that before? You know? oh, I, don't, I don't, I don't know about that. No. Um, it sounds like the one you're doing is like the way you're doing yeah. it's the best way. Cool. Perfect. I mean, I've got your EPK onto YouTube instead of YouTube thing. That's so easy. Just do it as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like, as long as it's one click, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As long as it's like going, here's the music, boom, and it's there. Yeah. And you don't have to, like, go through, like, you know, those, like, Facebook ones. The, a tree, a tree, a car, a tree. Do you know what I mean? Like, as long as you don't have to, like, go through some of that shit, then you're all right. Cool. Thank you. Or any, any other questions? I think we're good. Well, all I'd say for everyone here is these kind of events are so important in terms of, you know, meeting people, it's a context game, it definitely helps to try and talk to as many people as possible, I feel, and there are so many panels, so I would recommend getting to as many as possible and talk, don't be shy, talk to as many people as possible and just take that knowledge 
But I just want to say thanks so much on behalf of Upcoming Eyes and Wild Pass and everyone here for, for you being here and for the book as well, because it is a brilliant read and, you know, there's some copies. Don't let this man get a bad back on the way home. <laughs> Buy that book, because it is yeah. uh, such a good resource, so I'd really recommend it. Well, good. Th thank you very much. Give it up for Sonny. Thanks so much for watching. I really enjoyed chatting with Phil and honestly, I really recommend his book. There are so many artists and music industry professionals who contributed to the book. So if you're an artist looking to break through or you want to work in the music business, grab a copy by visiting philtaggartslacker.com. I'll be back soon with new content when I get the chance. I'd love for you to leave a comment below with your thoughts and feelings on the interview and if there's any other content that you'd like to see. I'm really going to try to do more regular content in 2020, probably more filming on the fly. It can be quite hard putting everything together because I'm pretty precious about how everything looks and what's in the content that I put out. That will never change, but I'll try to find ways to speed it up. For now, please click like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you want to see more. You know what, I'd really love to hear what your album of the year has been. So if you've got this far, knock it down in the comments and we can have a discussion about it. Until next time, here's some videos. Just, I mean, click them. Give it a go. What else you got to do?